Good morning, everyone, and welcome to developing flexible authorization capabilities with ASP.NET Core. I'm Jason Taylor, a solution architect for SSW. I help customers develop, deploy, and test custom solutions in the cloud. You can find me on GitHub at Jason Taylor Dev or on my blog, jasontaylor.dev. Today, I'd like to show you authorization with ASP.NET Core. We'll look at authorization in ASP.NET Core, the standard approach and a flexible approach. We'll look at authorization in Blazor WebAssembly, and we'll look at some code, three demos, and I'll summarize it for you at the end. Before we get started, I just want to let you know that SSW has a cool new SSW Rewards app. You can download this app from the App Store by searching for SSW. You can scan codes at SSW talks and events to earn points and collect prizes. A little bit of background information before we get started. So authentication is the process of determining a user's identity, whereas authorization is the process of determining what resources a user has access to. Now, authentication is independent of authorization, but you need to remember that authorization requires an authenticated user. So authorization determines access to resources, but what exactly are resources? Well, resources can be a number of things, such as data, files, views, and features. Authorization also includes defining and enforcing access control rules as policies, which are then used by the system to grant or reject access requests to specified resources. The focus of this talk will be authorization with ASP.NET Core. I'll demonstrate a typical approach using role-based access control and then a flexible approach using permissions-based access control. And you'll see that with the flexible approach for sufficiently complex problems that this will save you a lot of time and money improving your maintainability of your code and generally the happiness of your developers. So the talk will be built using, sorry, the code will be built using Blazor WebAssembly and ASP.NET Core, and I'll share a link to the code and slides at the end. So authorization with ASP.NET Core. It supports very simple authorization capabilities, such as, such as authorizing an authenticated user or allowing anonymous access for a user. But it also includes sophisticated authorization capabilities, such as role-based, claims-based, policy-based, resource-based, and view-based authorization. In addition, it's easy to create custom authorization policies, and it's also easy to customize the authorization behavior using middleware. Let's take a look at some examples. So first, with simple authorization, we can use the authorize attribute on a controller, action, or razor page. In this example, the authorize attribute has been applied to the account controller. And that means that users of the account controller can only access login and log out if they are authenticated, which of course is a big problem because they, they can't log in unless they're authorized. We can fix that. We'll move the authorize attribute down to log out. So now anonymous users can access login and authenticated users can access log out. Here's another example where we've again applied authorize to the account controller, and we've simply applied allow anonymous to the login. So that means all of the uh, actions within this controller will require an authenticated user, except for the login action. Now let's look at authorization with roles. Again, using the authorize attribute, we can specify roles for a particular uh, action. So in this case, we've applied the authorized attribute to the administrator controller and specified the administrator's role. That means to access the actions within this controller, it requires an authenticated user who is a member of the administrator's role. Next up, we have the authorized attribute specifying two roles. That means the user must be a member of either the administrator's role or the account's role. And finally, we have two authorized attributes, both specifying individual roles. And this means that the user must be a member of both the administrators and the accounts roles. So you can see the authorized attribute is quite flexible. You can apply it in a variety of different ways to, to define your access policy. 
Next up, we have authorization with policies, which is really the engine of the ASP NetCore authorization system. With policy-based authorization, we can again use the authorize attribute to specify a policy. In this case, access to the employee controller will be restricted, restricted to users who meet the requirements of the employees only policy. Well, how do we define that? Well, generally, these policies are defined when you're defining your services. So we've added a policy called employees only and added a single requirement. And that is that this the authenticated user requires a claim employee number, but we don't much uh, need to worry about what value it is, just that they have that claim. Now we'll look at authorization in Blazor WebAssembly. It's important to remember that Blazor WebAssembly is an ASP.NET Core technology, so it supports many of the same authorization capabilities. So it supports simple authorization capabilities, such as allowing anonymous access or uh, restricting access to certain capabilities. Uh, it includes the same sophisticated authorization capabilities, such as role, claims, and policy-based. And it includes additional authorization components, such as authorized view and authorized route view. The important thing about Blazor WebAssembly is that it's running in the client. So it's important to remember that the authorization you place there, like the validation that you place there, is really only to improve the UI and user experience. We can conditionally show and hide items, but all of that can be bypassed uh, by the user by disabling JavaScript or crafting an attack. So we still need to enforce authorization on the server side. Let's have a look at some examples with Blazor. So for simple authorization, again, we can use the authorize attribute on a routable page. So in this case, we've simply applied the attribute, which means that only authenticated users can access the home page. Here, the authorize attribute has specified two roles. So an authenticated user who is either a member of administrators or the accounts role. And here, we've specified the employees only policy. So only a authenticated user who meets the requirements of the employees only policy can access the users page. Authorization with views. So we apply authorization, sorry, the authorized view to selectively display content. Three examples here. You can see the home link is only accessible to authenticated users. The counter link is only accessible to authenticated users who are a member of one of those roles. And finally, the users link is only accessible to the employees. Next up, we have the authorized view where we're specifying what to show if the user is not authorized. So you can see here, the login link will be displayed if the user is not authorized. Let's have a look at what it takes using the typical approach with ASP.NET Core authorization being role-based authorization. Let's have a look at what it takes to add a new role to an existing application. And in this, in this scenario, we're going to add an auditor role to support certain requirements. Let's have a look at the application quickly. So this is the application. It's Blazor WebAssembly hosted on ASP.NET Core. At the moment, I've built in some capabilities to manage the users. You can see there's an admin and an auditor user. And in this form, we can actually assign different roles. So we're going to go ahead and create an auditor's role for the auditor. For a little bit of fun, we can also see the claims that are associated with the user. In this case, I'm logged in as the administrator, and I can see the, administrator, sorry, the role claim, which has a single value of administrators. So, to add a new role, we'll go to the database initializer. That's where I've defined the roles for this application. So we'll duplicate this code. I love to copy and paste. And uh, I love multi-cursor too. So we we'll specify the auditor's role. And then here, using ASP.NET Core Identity, we'll go ahead and create the auditor's role. Again, copying and pasting and auditors. There we go. So when the application starts up in development, it will automatically create that auditor's role for me, and I can assign the auditor to that role. I'll just minimize that. But that's not the only change we need to make, because we're not actually using the auditor's role anywhere. So let's start at the front end and apply the auditor's role where necessary. The first thing that I'd like to update is the nav menu. Not that one, nav menu, there we go. 
So in the nav menu, I'd like to give the auditor access to, let's see, to, to see the counter. So we put in the auditor's role there. Uh, to be able to see the weather forecast. So we'll put in the auditor's role there. And also to see a list of users. That'll give them a little bit more access than what I want, but I don't have actually fine-grained control of authorization on users, so they'll be able to see the users, but they'll also be able to edit the users. So that's a bit problematic, but that's okay. We'll stick with that. So that's the nav menu. If I was to run it now, they could see the nav menu, uh, but they wouldn't be able to access any of the pages because they're all secured as well. So let's have a look at the counter page. And we can see that's administrators and accounts. We can go ahead and add auditors, fetch data. Okay, same thing. And the users page. That's in users index. All right. Now that takes care of the front end but we have controllers in the back end which also require authorization. So we're protecting the resources on the back end, of course. So we can start with the weather forecast controller, which powers the fetch data. And we can also update the users controller. And I think that's it. So let's run the application again and see how it works. <clears throat> so, so far we've had to make a bunch of code changes. We'll need to eventually test this application, deploy it, and we'll also need to document these authorization requirements. At the moment, these requirements are only declared in code, so we'll need a separate piece of documentation that we can share with the business so they can understand who has access to what. And of course, we're going to need to keep that document up to date, which as developers, something we're very good at. All right, over here. Let's see if we can see that new auditor's role and assign the auditor. We can, that's a good start. Just need to click on it. There we go, save that. And then I'll go ahead and log out and log back in as an auditor. we go. So that's good. I can see counter, fetch data, and users. I can access counter. I can access fetch data, and I can also access the data coming back from the server. I can access users. Unfortunately, I have a little bit more access than what I need because I don't have fine-grained control of that access. Um, so we need something a little bit more than that. All right, so what would it look like if we had a better system? What would it look like if we had flexible authorization with ASP.NET Core? Well, first, I'd like it to be easy for me to add new roles and configure access control. Following that, I'd like it to be easy to reconfigure access control for existing roles. For large organizations and large applications, these things change all the time. I was in a, one organization for eight years, and they went through three restructures with different team names. My role didn't change, but my team name did, and that affected a lot of the systems. I would like to be able to remove roles without ex uh, impacting existing access control checks. We can't do that right now. If we want to go and remove roles, we've got code changes, testing, building, deploying, and documentation updates. I would like to easily view access control policies. I really don't want to maintain any documentation on that. And I'd like to support all of the above as standard application features. I want this to be the experience that's provided to the end users of the application. So let's have a look at this adding a new role again, the same auditor's role, but this time using a flexible approach to authorization. So we'll close down basic auth. and load up flexible auth. 
A little bit of a preview there of the permissions. But we'll run the application first. You get in there. This is my new super fast laptop. Always a little bit slower on stage. OK, let's log in. I'll log in again as administrator. And here we have a couple of new features. We've got roles. So let's go in and create an auditor's role. That's done. Now let's go and define access control for the auditor's role. So here it is, and here are all the permissions that are available in the system. You can see that these permissions are a lot more fine-grained, a lot more associated with the actual functionality in the application. For the auditor, I really just want them to be able to access the counter, the forecast, and to view the users, not to be able to manage the users. So I think we'll just leave it at that. Now those changes are already saved, so we can go ahead and log out and log back in as the auditor. Oh, actually, I forgot to assign the auditor role to the auditor, so we'll have to do that first. Okay, so we'll go to users, auditor, and assign that role. So you can assign one or more roles to users, and of course the user is going to inherit the permissions that have been assigned to those roles. All right, so back out, and in as the auditor. Okay, this is looking good. We have access to counter, we have access to fetch data, we have access to view the users, not to edit the users, and we can also see claims, which is nice. You can see the auditor's role uh, has been added as a claim. We also have this new permissions claim, which is, has an interesting value of 100. We'll get to that soon. First, I'd like to compare the standard approach with the flexible approach. So with the standard approach, we had to make code changes. We had to test those changes, which we didn't do. We had to build and deploy, and we had to document those changes, which we also didn't do. There's probably going to be some bug fixes on the way because we're actually impacting quite a few components within the system. With the flexible approach, we actually weren't required. So we just had free time. That could have been completed by an administrator or an end user. And that's excellent. We don't have to focus on these basic concerns. It means we can start delivering new requirements. We can start delivering business value. I'd like to talk about how the flexible approach works. First, let's think about the permissions. So permissions define granular access to resources. We saw that when we were able to provide fine-grained control of the users feature. We could either view users or edit users, of course, both. It was easy for developers to create permissions, and we'll have a demonstration of that later. And permissions are created generally when you're creating a new feature. So we don't have to go in and manage authorization independently. It's only when we're creating a new feature or if the access policy changes. It's a very normal development flow. Permissions are not assigned directly to a user. Rather, permissions are assigned to a role and the user will inherit the permissions of any assigned roles. So it makes it easy for us to create and compose access policies using roles and permissions and assign users the necessary permissions as a, uh, by assigning the necessary roles. So with flexible authorization, roles are only used to define a logical grouping of users. Administrators can, of course, create new roles as required and rename roles if, the, if, the, if required. Administrators assign permissions to roles, but we don't use roles for authorization because if we do that, we won't be independent of organizational changes and we'll have to update our code quite often. How does it work under the hood, the engine? Well, it's built entirely using policy-based authorization. And this is something that really excites me. We're using ASP.NET Core authorization out of the box 
to extend the authorization process, we're not writing the security ourselves. We're just defining some new requirements. We can use the custom authorization, uh, authorize attribute to specify required permissions. And required permissions are then translated into a policy name. So we'll have a look at that shortly. Where we were using the authorize attribute before to specify a role, we'll be using the authorize attribute to specify the required permissions. We will generate these policies dynamically uh, using an ASP.NET Core custom policy provider. So let's have a look at the code. Get rid of this. OK. Let's start here with the permissions. So you can see with permissions, we're using an enum, but we've applied the flag attribute. And that allows us to use and combine these permissions in very interesting ways. In fact, I've got a .NET interactive notebook that we can look at to understand that a little bit better. <clears throat> Let's go full screen. Full screen. There we go. Kind of better. OK, so we've got a simple example of some permissions here. You can see that each value is specified as a power of 2, starting at 1 through to 16. We have some interesting values, some interesting flags. We've got none, which is all zeros. And we've got all, which is the complement of none, all ones. So none would indicate no permissions, whereas all would indicate all permissions. Now these are using flags. And you can see that this flag here indicates the permission of A. And this flag here indicates the permission of B. Now we can do some interesting things with flags. If we wanted to say that the user had permissions A and C, as shown here, then we can simply add them together. So 00001 plus 00100 equals 00101 or 5. And so that value of 5 distinctly represents permissions A and C. So using enum flags, we can represent the user's permissions using a single number. So let's have a look at some demonstrations. Here we've got the user permissions of A and C and the required permissions of A and B. Sorry, A or B, OK? And so for a user to be uh, authorized based on the required permissions, they need permission either A or B. And in this case, the user has A. Let's have a look at what we could do with flags, outputting the permissions as a string. That didn't work. I didn't, I've got to run this block first. We'll try again. There we go. So if we simply output these user permissions as a string, it provides us a comma-separated value of the permissions that the user has and the require, required permissions. We can also output their integer values. So 5 and 3. We can check permissions using the bitwise AND operator. So we can see the user permissions are A and C, the required permissions are A and B, and they are authorized. We can add permissions to existing user permissions using the logical OR operator. So you can see that now the user permissions are A, B, and C. And we can re remove permissions using the logical XOR or exclusive OR operator. So now the permissions are back to just A and C. We need to do something interesting with these permissions. And I think I'll just show you one of these authorized attributes, let's say on the user's controller. So here we've got authorize, and we've specified the required permissions, view users or manage users. Now, when ASP comes to evaluate that access policy, it doesn't actually have an authorization policy to do that. It has to generate one. So we do that by first creating a policy name. And the policy name is simply permissions with the value of the required permissions, so the int value. So if we run this now, the required permissions are A and B, or the value 3. And so the policy name that we will create is called permissions 3. And this provides us with a very easy, out-of-the-box way to utilize 
ASP Net Core policy-based authorization. <clears throat> now here, we're just going to update the required permissions so we can see creating a different policy name. The permissions are A, B, and C, seven, and the policy name will be permission seven. So now we have the capability to create a policy name, but we also need to be able to later on get the required permissions based on that policy name. So here, we will get the permissions value from the policy name by finding that integer value. The policy name is called permission seven. We can pull that back out and know that that requires permissions A, B, or C. That's as complicated as it gets. Now we get to just use the ASP.NET Core authorization capabilities to do the rest. So the first thing that I want to look at is the application claims factory. And this is just a little helper. Can't find it. Hang on, try it again. App claims principal factory. So what this will do is add the new permission claim to the user. You saw that before when we looked at the claims. We had something like permissions 100. So first, it will have find all of the roles associated with the user. Then for each of those roles, it will add those permissions to the user permissions and then simply add that value as a string to the claim. So if I had permission seven, I would have a claim, permissions seven. Very simple, little bit of infrastructure. Next up, we have the flexible authorization policy provider. And this is responsible for dynamically creating authorization policies only when required. It's very lazy about it because we don't really know what policies will be required. We don't really know what uh, features the user will try to access. So we just create these in a lazy fashion. So there can only be one authorization policy provider. So we derive the flexible authorization policy provider from the default one. You can see that when a policy is required, it calls this get policy async method. Now the first thing that we do is just call the base class and try and get that policy, whatever the name is. And if it exists, then we're done. But if it doesn't exist, if the policy is null and the policy name is a valid permissions policy name, then we have some work to do. So the first thing we'll do is get the actual permissions flags from the policy name. So if it's permission seven, we'll take that seven and cast it back into an enumeration. Then, using the authorization policy builder, we simply build a policy based on that. Now, our policy has a single requirement, the permission authorization requirement, and the only thing we have to pass into it is the required permissions. We already have that, so it's a very simple policy. Having done that, it's just a matter of adding the policy, specifying the name, and the policy itself. Next time that same authorization check needs to occur, it won't be building the policy again. That'll be a one-time thing. Okay, so let's have a look at this permission authorization requirement. It's even simpler. We simply pass in the permissions and it stores it in a property. So how does this authorization requirement actually get handled? Well, we have a permission authorization handler. And this is where we actually look at the permissions that the user has by grabbing their permissions claim, converting it back into a permissions type, and then using the bitwise and operator to determine if there are any permissions in common. And that means that the user will have at least one of the required permissions, which is fine. Now, if that is then successful, we're done. We don't need to check anything else and we will exit, and that user will be authorized. And of course, if there are multiple authorized attributes, then it will come back and check against a second policy for that user. So that means that even with this permissions-based authorization approach, we can define very, uh, we, can, we can have well-defined access policies by organizing the attributes to express the requirements that we have. Next, let's have a look at the authorized attribute. So this is a special authorized attribute that is built into the flexible shared authorization capabilities. 
But again, it's just extending the out-of-the-box authorized attribute, and all it's doing is allowing us to supply some permissions. Now you can see here, it doesn't store the permissions. It stores the policy name. And that is a very normal behavior for the existing authorized attribute. We can already supply a policy. You can see that here. We can say employees only. Well here, we're pretty much doing the same thing. But instead of saying permissions A and C, we're saying permissions three in a roundabout way. We do that by when setting the policy, we will set generate a policy name given the value of permissions, and when returning it, we will pull the permissions back out of the policy name. So again, this is just driven by ASP Netcore policy-based authorization. Now, if you do have some more procedural code to write and you'd like to assess authorization requirements within that, then you use the authorization service. And this is built into ASP Netcore authorization. And I've simply added an extension method so that you can assess your authorization requirements against the required permissions using the same approach. We take in the permissions and convert it to a policy name. If that policy doesn't exist, ASP Netcore will automatically generate that policy for us and authorize against those required permissions. All right. <clears throat> so that's quite a lot to cover. So we'll pause there for a moment and take questions. Yes. Yep. Or five and two. Yes. Seven, so yep. What, what does it do in those yeah, of course. Well, the, some of those values that you specified aren't powers of two. So they represent combinations of flags rather than individual flags. And so when you look at the permissions here, they're all powers of two. So three and four, well, three is actually A and B, and four is actually C. So three and four uh, comes to seven, so that's one plus two plus four, so that's A, B, and C. Yeah, yeah. Okay, no problem. Yes? Um, when we're dealing with flags, we also have a massive count of numbers with this so we can have a massive 64. In this case, yes. Yeah. What do you do with that situation? So in, in this scenario, in this, in this specific one, so the enumeration is backed by an int. So 32 maximum values, excluding none and all. All is really useful. Um, actually, I'll, I'll, I'll just show you one thing that I really love about all, and then we'll come back to the maximum value. So if we go to the DB initializer, we'll try it. No, that's in another project. DB initializer. When I initialize the administrator's role, they always get assigned permissions all. And it's so easy to do that. So when we add a new permission, they automatically have it. If we update the permissions, they automatically have it. So yes. The permissions that I'm currently using are restricted to 32 permissions. If I change it to long, it'll be restricted to 64 permissions. 64 is pretty good, but it's not gonna work for every solution. So at that point, we have to decide what we want to do next. So we could start storing permissions in the database alongside the roles, and they could have an identity against each individual permission. Obviously, we're not going to then be able to uh, store the um, the uh, permissions in such a nice way using a single value. We'll have multiple claims representing the permissions that are available, or we could have something like comma separated values representing the permissions that are available. So we'll have to take a different approach, but the result will be the same. Roles and permissions will be stored using claims, and they will be assessed using dynamic authorization policies in ASP Netcore. Any other questions? No problem. Let's continue. I'd like to provide one final demonstration, adding a new permission. This will be typically completed by developers when they're building new requirements. The auditor currently does not have access to the access control page, and they would like to see who has access to what. So let's give that a try. So the first thing that we'll need to do is Update the permissions, not that one, this one. So we have the next value to be view access control 128. 
Okay, we'll stop that. <clears throat> so now we need to apply the policy for view access control where it's necessary. Let's start on the client again. So let's make that a bit smaller. So we'll go over here to, uh, I'll use the, sorry, I'll use the shortcuts. A little bit easier to find things when I don't have a mouse. Nav menu. Okay, so access control is down the bottom here. And currently only users with permissions configure access control. So we'll say configure or view access control. All right. Next up, we need to change the access control page itself. So I think that's at access control index. Good. And we can see here, the only real place that can make a change is the import. So let's use the authorized view. Now, I can't use the out of the box authorized view, so I created an extension on that, flexible authorized view. And we'll say that the authorized users must have, hopefully, let's clean this up a little bit. We'll say authorized and not authorized. Okay, now I really wanted to find some permissions here. Not coming up. Let's find out why. Flexible, authorized view. Whoops, I'm making a big mess. I've got to stop. <laughs> okay, making it worse. All right, trying again. Flexible, authorized view. So the flexible authorized view has the parameter permissions, which is interesting. But it's not coming up for me. So uh, it's just exploded. So let's go back here, and I will just put that in clipboard. Save the changes. Do a quick build. See if we get. Oh, that's not going to build. See if we get a better result. Thanks, Brendan. I'm glad you're here today. That's awesome. <laughs> Permissions dot. So, ah, oh, no. Well, no, yeah, you're right, you're right. That is right. Permissions dot. Uh, configure access control. There we go. So that's nice and easy to use. And then we can say, if you can configure access control, then you get the standard checkbox. And if you're not authorized, we'll just do a quick and dirty. And we'll say, you can't change it. And what's more, it's disabled. Okay. One last change to make, we have to protect authorization on the back end. So let's load up the access control controller. I could probably just call that the access controller. <laughs> it would be fine. There we go. So currently the entire uh, controller is restricted to configure access control. So we'll take that away and we've got two actions in here one to get the configuration so that'll be our view access control or depending on how we define our permissions it might be view or configure but our administrators have all so we'll just go view and then over here for update configuration of course configure access control so we'll go ahead and run that now and see if it's working as expected for the auditor can they view access control? Do they have read-only access? Wait for it to start up. Looking good. A bit of a mess here. That's not good. <laughs> 
try again. Okay, hang on a sec. This is flexible auth, so it must be running on a different port, and that's the old basic auth one. Here we go. Now, logging in, auditor. I knew that had happened. I've got to learn to copy and paste more. Okay, we can't see access control, so that's no good. I'm just gonna, of course, I forgot to assign order to the permission. Let's, let's leave that there so I don't have to type in the password more than I have to and go to incognito, logging in, admin, whoops, admin. I'm gonna have to bring a whole desk next time. I'll bring a desk, an extra monitor, a keyboard, a mouse, and my headset. <laughs> I'll be right at home. Okay, here we are. We can see everything. Scrolling down, we've got view access control, so we'll grant that to our auditors. We can come over here and do a quick refresh. They've got access control, and they're not authorized to access the resource. We can fix that too. So let's go to access control index. Now, of course, I'm trying to demonstrate how easy the flexible authorization approach is. So don't take this part as an example. So we'll go to the top here and change that to configure or view access control. Try again. There we go. Now, hot reload doesn't tend to work very well for me. So we'll just run it again. Sometimes it's working really nicely. I have the best results when I go .NET watch run rather than through Visual Studio, which is very nice. That's the administrator. And that's the auditor. So now you can see they have access to access control. They can't change anything. And so there's our documentation, right? We can see who has access to what. When developers create new features, they define the necessary access policies using permissions rather than roles. Okay, so in summary, today we looked at authorization with ASP.NET Core. I demonstrated the typical approach using role-based access control. And you saw that for a simple requirement, such as adding an auditor role, it was a lot of work. We had to develop, test, deploy, and document changes, which of course we forgot to do. I then showed a flexible approach using permissions-based authorization. And with this approach, it was trivial to add a new auditor role. Now, for small applications with a small amount of users, the standard approach is probably fine. If you just have one or two roles, say administrators and users, then the flexible approach could be overkill. But for production applications in large enterprise, typically a flexible approach will be essential. It's the only thing that will isolate you from those organization changes and help you to deliver, to deliver business value rather than making changes to support that sort of thing. And this is going to result in putting the power into the hands of the application users and administrators rather than the, the developers. So you can find the code and slides on GitHub if you're keen to learn more. So that's at github.com, Jason Taylor Dev, flexible ASP.NET Core authorization. As promised, here's the QR code for the SSW Rewards app. You can scan that code earn some points and win some prizes. I hope you've enjoyed my talk today. It's great to see so many of you in person. Thank you.
we've got plenty of time for questions if anyone has any more. Yes? Yeah, no problem. So when you're loading the permissions dynamically, I think that the best approach is to have a C-sharp file representing the identification and the name of those permissions as constants. That will give you some nice flexibility to apply those permissions in the same way, but then you'll need an additional process to sync those permissions to the database. Okay, and I like to do that uh, when, when the application is initialized uh, and basically what it will do is go and make sure all of those permissions are in the database and if not, it will go and create them. The, and of course, the permissions enumeration I showed is quite simple. I would also want to add some attributes to that so that we can have a description, so that we can have a display name, those sorts of things. But I wanted to focus on the engine behind the scenes so that you could see how to implement it. Any other questions? Can you can you say that again, sorry? Can you can you tag the method with the authorized attribute? That, that's the thing. That ideally, unless you're going to specify the permission name or identifier by hand, I think it's best to have some, some kind of C-sharp compiled object to represent those permissions. So if you need to have them in the database, by all means do that, but sync it based off that C-sharp class. Keep it synced based off that C-sharp class. Now that gives you the advantage of being able to query and join and easily associate additional information while also being able to use those authorized attributes. Any other questions? Yes? Oh, well, you've, you, let's have a look at the code. <clears throat> so it is all contained in this particular project within the shared project in a single folder called authorization. So essentially, your changes will be limited to this set of files and to any authorized attributes that you've applied or anywhere where you have used those permissions. So the impact of the change will be fairly limited, but it will, of course, depend on how many access policies you've actually applied. The nice thing is, is that when you move from permissions enumeration to something else, it'll be breaking changes, and you'll see those in the output, and you'll be able to fix them one at a time. So not too bad. Uh, of course, if you went to something like a a static class with constants, then it's almost the same. You'll be replacing those little or operators, uh, but yeah, otherwise not too difficult. Yeah, I'm starting to think that you could take just that permissions class, yes. that permissions enum, yes. a class called permissions, yes. operator overloading to implement something to do that, or you might not even change that at all. You yeah, that's right. Class to replace that enum. I didn't think about operator overloading. But yeah, that is cool. In, yeah. Yeah. That's right. No changes. And it's still very descriptive. A little bit more descriptive than when you say authorize roles. Yeah. We have to know that it's or. When we read the permissions value, we know that it's or because it's using the or operator. So permissions A or permissions B, rather than administrators, comma, accounts. It'll be easier to what, sorry? Yeah, and you could think about having multiple arrays of bit flags, but it... 
Yes, it gets a bit more difficult to manage because in the back end, we're creating a policy name. So we'd have to think about the max length of that policy name. Uh, and if we have multiple arrays of bit flags and we're saying uh, that uh, the permissions can come from any of those enumerations, it's just a bit tricky. I think we can do it, but yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Well, hopefully soon we'll get 128 bit. And then, then we'll have 128 options to play with. Maybe. All right, thanks again, everyone. I'll be around all day, so feel free to come up and chat, and we can look at the code and, and talk options. See ya.